Shalom, and welcome to the 17th installment in our series on the history of the Hebrew New Testament and the reemergence of Messianic Judaism. This is our third conversation around the Hebrew New Testament of Yitzhak Zalkinson, commonly known as the Zalkinson Ginsburg Hebrew New Testament. And uh, this is our first conversation about Ginsburg, after whom the uh, Zalkinson Ginsburg Hebrew New Testament is named. So this will be our first conversation about the life and the work of Christian David Ginsburg pictured here. Basically, Dr. Ginsburg was the English equivalent of uh, the German Dr. Biesenthal, whom we spent uh, what something like half a dozen conversations talking about. Um, I, I think he was probably the greatest English-speaking Hebrew scholar of the 1800s and perhaps of all time. Um, so basic, and, and not only that, but what, what Dr. Biesenthal was to Professor Franz Delich, roughly speaking, uh, Dr. Ginsburg was to Isaac Zalkinson. He was definitely uh, very helpful, and uh, perhaps it could even be said that he couldn't have done it without him, as we will begin to see. So in these conversations about Christian David Ginsburg, we'll start off with his relationship with uh, Isaac Zalkinson, and uh, his work on uh, Zalkinson's uh, New Testament translation. And then we'll also end these conversations about Ginsburg, uh, tie, tying it back into, into this theme. But along the way, we will really treat the life, of, the life and work of Ginsburg as, as its own thing, because uh, he, was, he was a great scholar, and uh, he, his contributions are absolutely uh, monumental, and uh, in my opinion, also awe-inspiring. So we left off in our last conversation with uh, Zalkinson suddenly dying on June 5th, 1883. Why don't we pick up where we left off there? Uh, this is another excerpt from uh, Dunlop's history. And uh, you'll see a couple of specific things about what happened to, happened to Zalkinson's uh, translation, which was still in a uh, rough draft manuscript state and not even completely finished, as we'll see here, when he passed away. Uh, let's see here. So, we we learn if you want to look on the left hand side here, we learn that the committee of the the committee of the Trinitarian Bible Society had kindly agreed to defray the cost of printing and publishing, what he regards that is what Zalkinson regards as the great work of his life. So this was written while he was still alive, um, his Hebrew translation of the New Testament, and he entertains the hope of being able to distribute it this year in Vienna as it's already in the hands of the printer. And then he. He uh, expresses some well wishes for the uh, the upcoming translation. All right, so we see here that in Zalkinson's final months of life, uh, the Trinitarian Bible Society had uh, agreed to basically take on the costs of producing the translation, and um, Zalkinson was hoping that he, it would actually come out and that he could uh, he could begin to distribute it in his own lifetime. All right, so there's another little excerpt here from Dunlop. Uh, apparently. As we see here, the secretary originally went to the British and Foreign Bible Society with uh, Zalkinson's manuscripts, but they were already busy uh, publishing uh, the Delich Hebrew New Testament, which had already come out. So at that point, they went to Dr. Bollinger, who was with the Trinitarian Bible Society, and uh, that was where that they struck upon that agreement. After Zalkinson died, as you can see here, it says... Um, it was found that he had left a small part of the work to be translated during its passage through the press. So he hadn't actually finished the whole thing. He came very close, but he didn't finish it. You may remember that he spent something like roughly five years doing the uh, the epistles, and then he spent something like five months doing the Gospels and Acts, or the majority of them. All right, so anyways... When this was discovered, Dr. Bollinger, as we can read here, asked the secretary to recommend someone to undertake this difficult and delicate task. He at once named Dr. Ginsburg, Mr. Zalkinson's old fellow student at the Society's Jewish Mission College, who had assisted him with the Masora, and he accepted the responsibility and the privilege of seeing the great work completed and carried triumphantly through the press. Hence, it has been appropriately called the Zalkinson Ginsburg Hebrew New Testament. So that's a rough chronology of what happened in those final months of Zalkinson's life, and then in that period of time after he died, before his Hebrew New Testament actually came out. 
and again, you can kind of you kind of have the sense of urgency here that you know it was just on the cusp of being produced. Uh, Zalkinson was really pushing hard. He was hoping to start distributing it soon, and then right when the majority of it had come out it had come out, he died. Um, so really, really in interesting timing there. Uh, Ginsburg himself said of this quote: "It fell to my lot to do it. I could not tolerate that the lifelong work of my departed friend should be lost, more especially." as I knew its value. So uh, at this point, Ginsburg was was working on his life's calling, his, his greatest achievement, um, his work on the Messorah. And he actually, he actually interrupted his massive work on the Messorah and he translated the last 15 chapters of Acts and he also added vowel points to most of the books. So that was Ginsburg's specific uh, contribution. He, he went over Zalkinson's uh, rough draft, he added vowel, vowel pointings, and then he also translated the last 15 chapters. So if you've ever read, or if you ever plan to read the, uh, the Zalkinson-Ginsburg New Testament, you can watch for, um, for Ginsburg's own, own translation, um, basically um, in the, 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 the last half of the Book of Acts. A little bit about Ginsburg. Here's another picture of him with an entry from the Jewish Encyclopedia. This is how he is, roughly speaking, remembered um, in the Jewish world. I'm not going to read all of this right now, but I'll point out a couple things, and you can feel free to pause it and, and read more of it for yourself. Okay, so firstly, you'll notice here in the little bibliography at the bottom that one of the um, sources quoted is Dunlop, J. Dunlop, which of course is also a, a source for the Zalkinson story that we have been referencing. Uh, you'll note here that he um, he converted, so to speak. He he came to believe in Yeshua um, at the um, relatively young age of um, 14, and I say 14 because he was born at the very end of 1831. So you know, we can roughly say that 1832 was his his first year of life, and we'll we'll generally use that reference as we are working through here. Um, so he was born shortly after the winter solstice, middle of the winter baby. And uh, again, you know, details on the, this early season of his life are, are very sparse, just like Zalkinson. Almost a little bit of mystery there, um, but th definitely they eventually um, emerged into, uh, in, into their own. So he, uh, Ginsburg, you'll notice he didn't work, uh, okay, so there, this is actually a little mistake here. He did not work for the London Society. Remember, that was the Anglican Society. He worked for the British Society, uh, which, was, which was different. Um, that that's the one that Zalkinson also worked with, and that was more like the the low church uh, versus versus high church. So um, when so he did several several it lists several works that he did here. We're not going to cover these right now, but we will definitely go over them as we proceed uh, in our um, conversations around um, Ginsburg's life. Um, Ginsburg became a full time scholar at the age of thirty two. So he he quit um, working for the Missionary Society and became a full time scholar. Uh, again, definitely kind of finding his stride in his own voice there. And um, you'll notice one thing here that it doesn't actually mention his contributions to the Zalkinson uh, Ginsburg Hebrew New Testament. Perhaps not surprisingly, uh, you may remember when it mentioned Zalkinson, it also mentioned uh, his his translation of the Hebrew New Testament in, in a rather negative way. And uh, so uh, Ginsburg died... Um, does it mention here? I don't think it actually mentions it here. He died on uh, March 7th, 1914. So uh, right around the close of that era, in the beginning of the um, the era that started with World War I, uh, culminated with and culminated with World War II and the uh, the reemergence of the the Jewish state. So he really he really lived up until the end of uh, of this era that really we're talking about as we look at the history of the, the, the translations of the Hebrew New Testament and the reemergence of Messianic Judaism. There is a short biography uh, also in uh, some Jewish Witnesses for Christ, another source that we have been referencing. Uh, I, I highlighted some of the, um, the things here that you may be interested in noting. Most of this is um, very similar to the entry in the Jewish uh, Encyclopedia. One thing I will point out here is that he contributed articles on Jewish topics to Kitto's Encyclopedia, and uh, that's John Kiddo specifically, and his his, uh, his story is very inspiring. I really wanted to cover it here, but I feel like it's just a little too far out and not not really in keeping with the main focus of these conversations. But I would encourage you to uh, look up John Kitto, and you can see how his last name is spelled right here, and uh, just 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 see how far he 
he went in his own lifetime. Um, from he, he experienced some very very difficult things in his life, and yet he 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 was able to rise over them and, and overcome them. Very inspiring. So yeah, look up him on on the side if you're interested in more history from that time period. So basically, what we're going to be doing in these conversations about um, about Christian David Ginsburg is we're gonna we're gonna look at the five epochs of his life. An epoch, of course, is a kind of like an era or a season. But I like the word epoch because it sounds significantly more epic. And uh, the, the scholarship of, of of Ginsburg really was that. So basically, in this first conversation, we're going to be looking at what I am going to call the romantic epoch of his life. Um, this was an era in which he studied the Megillot, the scrolls. you learn more about which exactly those are. And he wrote um, incredible commentaries on the, uh, the Song of Songs and on Ecclesiastes. And we will be using this picture here to represent this first um, epoch of his life, uh, specifically of his career. Um, after that, we'll also we'll also look at his uh, his epoch of of, of power. Going to call it that. A uh, number of papers that he gave at the Liverpool Society about the Karaites, the Essenes, uh, the Kabbalah, ancient versions of the Bible, and and also the Masora. We'll look at the uh, the epoch of his epoch of fame, um, in which uh, he did archaeological work on the the Misha stone, uh, the Sh- Shapira forger- forgery, and also his work on the Zalkins and Hebrew New Testament. And then we'll also look at the uh, the epoch of, of his epoch of glory, so to speak, working on the Messora itself. And, you know, these epochs really are, aren't, they're not, they're not clear cut. They do overlap some, but, but this will roughly cover um, some of his greatest achievements that he became known for. All right. So having said that, let's go ahead and look at um, his first great work that came out, his commentary on the Song of Songs. As you can see here at the bottom left, it uh, came out in London in uh, 1857 when uh, Ginsburg was only 25 years old and um, this this uh, is in PDF form by the way in the in our PDF collection so if you're if you're interested in you know getting a copy of this for yourself and uh, reading through it it really is a phenomenal scholarship it's it's a very um, inspiring and meaningful read and uh, I would I would encourage you to do that on your own time if you're interested all right. So, and you know, the link the link to our PDF collection should be underneath this video or somewhere on the page. So, look look around and uh, seek and you shall find indeed. All right. So, you'll just note the chapters briefly here. Um the title of the book, its canonicity, uh the design and method, the importance of it. Um he gives a historical sketch of the exegesis of the book, the way it was historically uh, understood and explained. Uh, he then goes on to classify and examine these different views in more depth. And then he talks about the, the author, the date, and the form of the book. And finally, um, his commentary starts on page 127, and uh, it runs for almost 100 pages. So I'll give you a quick overview of some of these sections, and you'll get a better sense of the, the heart and soul of Ginsburg himself at this relatively young age of 25, as you can see here in the preface. All right, so firstly, we see here, that this was his exposition of the first of the five books which are called Megillot. So a Megillah is a little scroll. Megillot are scrolls. He was hoping to uh, bring all five of these before the public in regular succession. However, he only did two of the five. As it turns out, uh, definitely Ginsburg accomplished so much in his life and his brain was clearly capable of so much more. His The depth of his, scho- his scholarship could have sustained it, but unfortunately he didn't get to live for hundreds of years or I'm sure he would have covered all of these things. Something you'll see, oh, so I, I will mention here too, um, so it, it looks like he had stu- he'd already spent time at the age of 25, he'd spent time really delving into the Megillot. You know, this came out at the age of 25, so he was delving into this at an earlier age. And uh, the other, the other Megillot, by the way, in addition to Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes, uh, are the books of Ruth, and Esther, and Lamentations. So you know, you'll, you'll see there's something interesting here. The Ruth and Esther are the stories of um, of uh, heroines, female heroes, of Scripture, and you'll see that he definitely was was in touch with this theme in this book also. And um, you'll you'll see something else here. I want you to take note. Of, of Ginsburg's 
style. He he was he was an absolute genius. His his scholarship was phenomenal. Like such a smart guy. Um, and, and very academic for sure, very solid in terms of academic, but he was also a passionate, um, he, he, he was romantic, he, he saw scripture through the eyes of poetry, and uh, he, he, really, he really set it on fire for his readers, and you're going to see that there, and it's, it's very rare to have that combination, um, someone who's both an academic and a storyteller, um, someone who's both a scholar and a poet, and I think that really comes through in the writings of Ginsburg, as you'll see for himself, and I mean, you even see that in the fact that of everything he could have written about, writ written about his first book was about <laughs> the Song of Songs, um, definitely, you know, it has, the, has that touch of romance, but it's also a very challenging work to try to explain and, and really do it justice. Um, so clearly at this age, his heart was, was really alive, and he clearly felt very deeply. Um, interesting here how he, he mentions that in, in his own aim in, in, doing this, in doing this commentary was to show that in its literal sense, the Song of Songs teaches a great moral lesson worthy of divine inspiration. And uh, so, kind of interesting, we, we, we talked, when we were talking about Zalkinson, we, we mentioned how um, you know, he he translated Romeo and Juliet almost as Musar for youths. It's like, hey, don't don't fall in love with the wrong person and end up killing yourself. Um, you know, take a lesson here. Um, and, and it's really quite interesting how, in his own way, Ginsburg also wrote his commentary on the Song of Songs as Musar, as a great moral lesson, um, with the intent of inspiration. So you almost see uh, some, some, some kindredness there between the souls of Zalkinson and his, his friend Ginsburg. Interesting here how he mentions the, um, there's a parallel between the story of the Shulamite in the Song of Songs and the people of God in general. It's interesting how he, 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 he references the people of God. Um, you know, would this, would this refer to the church, to the body of Christ in his understanding? Yes. But clearly it would also refer to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel. So I think he almost gets around um, like creating a dichotomy between those two by simply referring to them as the people of God. I might be reading into that, but that is a little side observation. Um, he mentions the um, Jacinius's grammar, and he quotes this in many places throughout his commentary. Um, he also mentions Forst, who was working on his lexicon and hadn't even completed it yet. Uh, Forst was uh, one of Professor Franz Delitz's teachers, so there's a there's a connection there. Um, gener of, of course, you know Ginsburg and Delitz both lived at roughly the same time, but it's interesting that there are some there are definitely some connections there, and I'll point out more of those connections to you as we go along. You'll also see on this page here, that he tenders his hearty thanks to his esteemed friend, the Reverend Isaac Zalkinson. So that's that's touching. Something that you'll see throughout the writings of Ginsburg is that he, he really honors his friends and his family members, and he shows affection to them in his dedications, in the thanks that he gives. Uh, again, it's a, it just it stri strikes me as being a very balanced person. Um, I have no idea why he calls him Zalkinson of Hamburg. No idea. I can't find that anywhere else. Um, if, if you have any info on that, feel free to send it my way. So at, at the time of this writing, by the way, Ginsburg was 25 years old and Zalkinson was uh, 12 years his senior. Zalkinson was 37 years old. So it could very well be that Zalkinson was something of a, you know, an older friend and something maybe of a mentor um, in, in, the life of, uh, in the life of Ginsburg. So here are a couple pages just so that you have a better sense of his, his style in writing. Uh, just, just writing about the title of the, uh, this book and uh, what the title meant. If you want, you can go ahead and read this for yourself. There's lots there, very informational. What I'm going to point out specifically is how he writes here, this song is the first of the Hamesh Megillot, the five Megillas, or books which are annually read in the synagogues. So we learn here that the Song of Songs was read on Passover. Ruth was read on Pentecost. Well, was and is, I should say. Lamentations on the Fast of the Ninth of Av, which is in the middle of summer, roughly. Uh, Ecclesiastes was read on Sukkot, Tabernacles. And then finally, Esther was read, surprise, surprise, on Purim. Um, oh, that makes sense. All right. Um, now, something I will mention to you here. I would even... Um, put this out here, there as a suggestion that you read Ginsburg com Ginsburg's commentary on the Song of Songs during the week of Passover. It would be a very meaningful time not only to read Song of Songs but to read this commentary. So maybe you can uh, you can um, 
put that on your calendar. Uh, similarly, you know, Ginsburg also wrote commentary on Ecclesiastes, which is read during the week of Sukkot or Tabernacles. So maybe you could also read his commentary on Ecclesiastes during Sukkot. I'll put that out there for you. These are such qual quality works, and I really do hope through these conversations to see them revived, to see interest in these works revived, and to see them really um, given the uh, the place of honor that they deserve in um, in the Messianic Jewish community and on a broader level. It's, it's, it's rather sad to me that to some degree these works are just, they've accumulated dust, almost nobody knows about them, and uh, most people who would identify with the Messianic Jewish community really don't know their own history, and they are disconnected with, really, with the roots that we are discussing in these, in these lessons. So anyways, hopefully um, this, might be, this might be something that could really take off, um, reading Ginsburg's commentary on this book, during the Feast of Passover, reading his commentary on Ecclesiastes during the week of Sukkot. Sit in your sukkah and read Ginsburg's commentary. So next page here, we'll skip over. Um, Ginsburg had a deep belief in the Word of God as the Word of God um, and that it was inspired. He talks about the canonicity of this book. Um, he says that the, he has no sympathy with those who affirm that the Old Testament scriptures contain... Um, okay, anyways, long sentence there, basically. He definitely believed that the Song of Songs was the Word of God and belonged in the Bible. And you can read his much more fluent expression of that there. But he does say, We believe that every book of the Old Testament is inspired, and that's why it's obtained a place in the Hebrew canon. He gives some history of that there. Interesting little side note here, by the way, about the process... Uh, whereby um, books of the, the Hebrew Bible were admitted to the canon and kind of the, the phraseology that was used to express that, which can be a little confusing if you're not familiar with the commentary on that. All right, so he starts by affirming that. Um, he then goes on to uh, kind of tell the story of Song of Songs, tell the story of the Shulamite in his own words. Um, he says, okay, his summary is that it records an example of virtue in a young woman who encountered and conquered the greatest temptations and was eventually rewarded. He, goes on, he then goes on to unpack it. There was a family living at Shulam, consisting of a widowed mother, several sons, and one daughter, who of course is the star of the story, who maintained themselves by farming and pasturage. All right, so then he goes on to tell the story in his own words on this page, on this page, and um, he goes on to uh, talk about the plot here. Again, you know, pause this if you want, look over this in greater, de greater detail, and maybe just read the whole thing for yourself also. Um, he goes on, after kind of summarizing the story, to uh, summarize the five sections that he sees in this drama, and uh, gives a little more detail for his, his, uh, his own summary of the story. So there's the first section, second section, etc., then goes on to uh, talk about the importance of the, the book. And I believe that this is an area in which uh, Ginsburg stood out and shone in his generation. Um, he made a very powerful argument for women's equality at the height of the Victorian era. He was, in my opinion, a prophetic voice, a voice ahead of his time. Um, the word feminist means many things to many people. Of course, there are versions of feminism that are extreme, not saying that I would agree with that in any way. Uh, there's also a feminism that perhaps you could say would be biblical feminism, the belief that women and men are equal, um, amongst other things. And in that regard, you could say that Ginsburg was a, a biblical feminist in the best sense of the word. He really he really spoke out on behalf of women. And uh, don't, don't take my word for it. I'll show, I'll show you a little bit about this for yourself. So firstly, he, he makes the point that the hero of this book, as you can see here, is a woman, a very virtuous woman. And um, I'm going to read you a couple of quotes here because I just I found it to be very powerful and inspiring. And uh, again, it's like this glimpse into the inner heart of Ginsburg, who was not just a great scholar and academic, uh, but also really cared about people, as you can see here. So he, ha he makes his, his, his argument here that, that men and women were created with the same intellectual and moral powers. He does a really nice job unpacking this phrase, helpmate corresponding to him. 
Um, and then also the phrase uh, kenegdo, which in, rabbin in rabbinic usage means exactly like one another here, uh, one another. Um, interesting point he drives home here. So he says, the word of God affirms here that the woman was created exactly with the same capacities as the man and contains no intimation of subserviency to him or of being in the slightest degree weaker or less virtuous than he. The fact that the tempter assailed the woman and not the man, so far from showing that the woman was weaker, would rather prove that she was stronger, that the cunning serpent knew this and was persuaded if he could only prevail again over the woman, she, with her superior influence, would be sure to succeed with the man as the sad result showed. He also makes the argument here that uh, the woman was held accountable for her, her actions just as much as the man. He goes on to talk about the curse and that it doesn't refer to any intellectual or moral, but rather to a physical inferiority. And uh, I really like how he refers to Adam and Eve here as the protoplasts residing in paradise. Great word that I had never encountered before. All right, we'll move on a little bit here to the next the next pages. Again, you might want to pause this and read this for yourself in greater detail. Let's see. I'm going to read another little section here. This is really quite pro, uh, poetic. So middle of the, the left-hand page, he says, The notion, therefore, that the woman is intellectually or morally weaker than man is not the teaching of the Word of God. Again, you know, you, have, you realize that he is in, in, in Victorian England writing this. While man, through his superior out-of-door qualities or physical strength and courage, is the supporter, protector, and ruler of the woman, she, through her superior indoor qualities, her endurance and her charm, charms, ameliorates his government and sways his inmost heart. Their different characteristics, arising from their different destinations, were designed to blend together so as to produce a happy harmony and to make both one. So you hear a little bit of com complementarianism there too. Um, but you definitely hear he, he, he makes a very strong case for equality. Um, and then he, he you, you really hear um, a certain degree of rage here um, when he then goes on to talk about how how women have been treated historically and maybe even how they were being um, treated in, in, in Europe in the 1800s. Um, he says, but how vilely and treacherously has man employed his superior strength and audacity? Instead of maintaining, protecting, and defending the woman, he has used his strength to oppress, to crush, and to degrade her. As the human race became more and more alienated from their creator, intrinsic merit and moral character were despised, and physical force became rampant. The stronger, as among animals, oppressed and preyed upon the weaker, and thus woman became the slave of man, and was absolutely sold in the capacity of daughter or wife as cattle and other property. Doesn't sound like Ginsburg was very happy about that. He mentioned some examples of that in scripture. He mentioned some historical examples from ancient Babylon and um, other examples from the Assyrians and the Arabians, um, etc., etc. Next page, he mentions polygamy, harems, which were basically prisoned, uh, the way women were basically enslaved and trafficked, and uh, definitely, uh, definitely outrage there. And he makes a very powerful argument uh, against that, calls it out. Next page, um, he mentions uh, the way Jewish women were treated. And this is notable too. Just mention, a, read a couple sentences here. He says, though the Jewish women were treated more leniently and enjoyed greater privileges than their sex in other nations, yet it's evident from a variety of circumstances in Old Testament history that they were not wholly emancipated from a state of unnatural inferiority. Polygamy was practiced amongst the Jews and its debasing effects were obvious. Harems, veils, eunuchs, etc. All right, so moving on a little bit here. He mentions that, that, that in the process of men degrading women, they also degraded themselves. And he makes a very, very powerful case for that also. Um, how you know, one, one sex of the human family had been so degraded by the other. He uh, expresses it really quite vividly here and then he, he drives this point home how great is the importance of a book the song of songs which celebrates the virtuous example of a woman and thus strikes at the root of all her reproaches and her wrongs so basically he believes that the song of songs is the vindication 
of um, of the female gender. We'll read a little bit here because this is really, really quite eloquent. The importance of this view of the book may be further seen from the fact that, in proportion to the degradation of women, men themselves have become degraded. For, deprived of the meliorating influences which the delicacy and tenderness of women were designed to have over them, and never more needed than in their fallen state, they've abandoned themselves to their worst passions and desires, and thus their whole civil and social condition has been proportionately undignified and unblessed. Look, on the other hand, at the state of society where woman is restored to her rightful position. There we shall find refinement of manners, purity of conversation, mutual confidence and affection, domestic happiness, intellectual enjoyment, freedom of thought and action, sympathetic repose, and whatever, in fact, tends to mitigate the unavoidable evils of the present life, all referable in a, in a greater or lesser degree to the unrestricted influence of woman upon the child and upon the man. In religion, her influence is still more potent. If first in the transgression, she is first in the restoration. And were man is ready to follow her in doing good, as he has been in doing evil, the world would long ago have been in a holier and happier state than it is at present. Who constitute the principal part of our worshipping assemblies? Women. Who form the chief portion of the members of our churches? Women. Who are the chief agents in the religious education of our children? Women. And who are the main support of our various benevolent and evangelical institutions? Women. So that's a little excerpt for you um, from Ginsburg arguing at the height of the Victorian era uh, on behalf of the, uh, the intelligence and um, moral fiber and equality of women in society. I wish I knew more about how this was received, how it was responded to. Um, we could infer this probably made a difference. Um, it probably you know, helped to guide England in a good direction, but we really don't. I really couldn't find any sources on that. So at this point, we'll just have to, we'll just have to infer um, that that happened. So moving on, this is an excerpt from his overview of how this book was interpreted throughout history. Uh, it's a historical sketch of its exegesis. Uh, you'll see here some um, quotes from rabbinical commentaries, um, which definitely Im employed midrashic interpretation. Um, you know, it t took some took some li liberties, uh, tried to understand it more allegorically, um, delved into the the deeper symbology, etc. Uh, remember too that. This was extremely groundbreaking in its time. Um, most Christians were unaware of Jewish interpretations of Scripture. There were some commentaries on the Bible that included rabbinic sources. Dr. John Gill was definitely one of those, um, but mm, there wasn't much out there. And so here comes Ginsburg, and you know, how, show, showing how Song of Songs was interpreted historically by the Jewish people, showing some rich examples of Jewish commentary on the Bible. I have no doubt once again that that, that made a difference and that his, his readership um, was, was drawn to uh, be more interested in and more, uh, more open to the Jewish roots of their Christian faith. All right, so anyway, some examples there about how the Jewish people historically understood this as uh, an allegory for God's relationship with Israel. Um, you'll see here he kind of mentioned some of the different different eras, 892 to 942, uh, the advent of Rabbi Sa Saadia Gaon. Next page. Um, also mentions uh, Rashi, who was um, mistakenly referred to as Jarki <laughs> in a bunch of the, the, the older Christian writings, uh, quoting Rashi including Dr. John Gill, whom I had already mentioned. He has some really nice quotations here from Rashi. The design of this book is to show to Israel that God has not afflicted her willingly, that though he did send her away, he has not cast her off, that she is still his wife. Again, you can't help but maybe, maybe sense Ginsburg's own heart there for the Jewish people um, to whom he belonged. He moves on also to uh, some of Ibn Ezra's commentary, which again is, is really quite beautiful. Talking about how this is a book of consolation, of comfort for the people of Israel. He um, moves on from Jewish interpretations to um, historical Christian interpretations. Um, for instance, in 1600, a guy named Thomas Brightman 
uh, kind of adopted this um, this this view that the first part of the book describes the condition of the legal church. In other words, you know, like the people of God, Israel under the law, um, you know, from David to the death of Christ. And then after that, the rest of it is about the evangelical church um, from the first to the second comings of Christ. Um, <laughs> he says, we give the following analysis of this curious commentary. So clearly he didn't completely agree with this or appreciate it. You can read all this if you want. It's, you know, one of many interpretations that he, he gives sketches of. Uh, but you just see, like, the, the lists of people who who propagated certain views, um, gave certain orations, etc. And clearly the, the research that went into this book, the background research, is absolutely mind-boggling. Especially considering they didn't have the internet back then. Um, Ginsburg had to go to you know, various museums, libraries, and, and collect all this from real books in person. If you can imagine that. No Rabbi Google to consult. Um, he goes on to give more historical, kind of a, in his chronology of historical interpretations. He mentions Ewald. It sounds like he liked Ewald's um, interpretation because he showed in a masterly manner that this poem celebrates chaste, virtuous, and sincere love, which no splendor is able to dazzle nor flattery to seduce. Now, interestingly enough here, he mentions some new commentaries that had re recently come out by Kyle and Delich. So firstly, he mentions uh, Kyle, and then he also mentions, okay, so 1851. This was, you know, not even a decade before, if I'm not mistaken, before this came out. When did it come out again? So this is, um, let's have a quick look here. Okay, so this so it came out in 1857. So this was six years earlier. Uh, Delich came out with his interpretations. He mentions him as a uh, th this learned author, so you know definitely with definitely with respect in that regard. And uh, he basically summarizes it by, by saying that uh, Delich confesses that amongst other views, that which regards the poem as celebrating the victory of virtuous love in humble life over the allurements of royalty is to be preferred. So it sounds like they were roughly speaking on the same page about how the Song of Song of Songs was to be interpreted. Give you a couple sample pages of his commentary, which runs um, to over 100 pages. So firstly, he gives a little summary of the section. He then gives his own translation of the verse. And then he gives a lot of commentary, as you can see here. And you can go ahead and pause this if you want, look over some of it, get a better sense. Um, he mentions here, here's Jacinius, he mentions the Greek, the Latin. Um, Forst, remember, remember Forst was, uh, he was working on his lexicon and he was one of Professor Franz Delich's teachers. Um, the Septuagint, the Vulgate, uh, you know, which of course are the Greek and Latin translations. Um, lots there. Lots of the Syriac, which of course is the the Aramaic translation. More Ewald. There's Delich, so he mentions Delich, which of course was only what like it had only come out six years before that, if I'm not mistaken. So you know clearly he's 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 drawing on a a broad range of sources, both ancient and um, what what were in his time modern. This book ends with a list of works by the same author. Um, and we're going to kind of get this bird's eye view of most of these. There were some that I was unable and regrettingly, re regrettably to find. I'll just I'll point out those ones to you briefly. Uh, the doggest olives of these particular manuscripts. His commentary on Leviticus breaks my heart. I could not find the Ginsberg commentary on Leviticus. I have no doubt that that would be rich reading. Uh, the text of the Hebrew Bible in abbreviations. I was unable to find the Posics throughout the scripture. So these are some, you know, with the exception of his commentary on Leviticus, these were probably smaller, lesser works, which may have been why they, they didn't survive, or they may have been bundled into other works. I don't know. Um, but we will be looking at these other ones specifically as we continue with these conversations. So we'll finish this conversation by uh, looking at his second work from his the romantic era of Ginsburg's life, roughly speaking, you know, his 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 twenties, 
um, Coelet, the book of Ecclesiastes, which, as you can see here, came out. Um, okay, so actually, it originally came out in 1861. This was a slightly later later edition. So this came out in 1861 when um, Ginsburg was 29 years old. Uh, this runs to a total of 528 pages, so definitely longer and therefore also more comprehensive and detailed, even than his work on the Song of Songs. Um, whatever Ginsburg may have been accused of, I don't think he was ever accused of not being thorough. He was incredibly thorough, detailed, comprehensive in how he mastered subjects and books and uh, summarized them for people. So, you know, once again, this might be um, something that you would enjoy reading um, over the festival of Sukkot in the fall. Sit in your sukkah and read Ginsburg on Ecclesiastes. After all, it is only, what, like a little over 500 pages, so that's only, you know, not even 100 pages a day. And you'll feel really smart by the end, too. I did want to point something out here. I mentioned previously that we have these touches of humanity um, coming through uh, in very warm ways in um, in Ginsburg's writings. This is an example. There's a dedication when he's 29 to his father-in-law, William Crossfield X Esquire, and uh, he 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 affectionately inscribed this work to him. So it sounds like he had not only a very uh, a positive uh, relationship with his wife, but also with his in-laws. Um, I I did do some. I did do some some research into uh, his his wife and his family. There isn't too much information, but I was able to find some things. Oh, by the way, this is interesting. I'd mentioned Dr. Gill. He mentions Dr. John Gill over here in the bottom, along with other people. Um, so I, what I was able to find, and you might want to look this up for yourself, is that uh, so Ginsburg lived in, in um, oh, which city was it again? Liverpool. He lived in Liverpool. Yeah, during during these earlier years, and um, his his father in law was a Quaker, so his wife's family was a uh, was from the Quaker tradition, and uh, he was he was a wholesale grocer. I was able to find a little bit more information about them in this old book, a really nifty book by the way, Armorial Families. It's this directory of um, various coat 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 of arms, coats of arms. Not sure how you'd say that, uh, but anyway, it was a, a directory of the legal ones because. I assume people were also making stuff up that, and using e illegal coat of arms. Something I'm not completely familiar with, but it's really quite a fascinating world. So we see here, this was William Crossfield Jr. So this would have been the uh, this would have been Christian David Ginsburg's brother-in-law, and uh, we see that he really um, he was a very influential person in the city of Liverpool. We are going to be learning more about the city of Liverpool, what it was like there, and uh, Ginsburg's interactions with the, the the academic community there in a later conversation. Here we'll just point out that he was an MP, a member of Parliament. Um, he was also a Justice of the Peace. So he was born in 1838, so a little younger than Ginsburg it sounds like. So once again we here we see we see William Crossfield and uh, we learn that his, his wife's name was Eliza. So Ginsburg's uh, parents-in-law were William and Eliza. And um, you'll notice here, too, that um, Eliza was the daughter of James Riley. I'm trying to remember what I... I learned some things about him. I'm not going to go into too much of this. Um, and apparently he married a gal named Fanny, who was the daughter of a merchant. Uh, Liver Liverpool is a very, very strong... Um, center of commerce, lots of mercantile activity there, so that's not surprising. Um, so William Crossfield Jr., Ginsburg's brother-in-law, was also, um, he's also mentioned in the charter of the University of Liverpool. Um, he apparently was on the Council of Governors, so he was definitely very involved with, uh, with city life. So it sounds like Ginsburg um, married into a family that um, definitely was influential and had some degree of wealth, which probably assisted him in, in really striking out as a in, in his own scholarly career. So that's a bit of a side note. We'll get back to um, this our, our story here. So we see here in his little introduction that, where is it? Okay, he mentions at the end here, that he actually, where is it? 
Yeah, okay, here. He spent seven years labor on this commentary. Seven years of his life. So, you know, he wrote this when he was 29. So he would have he would have begun his research on uh, Ecclesiastes um, seven years earlier in 1854 when he was 22. Um, he then goes on to spend nine pages just on the title Koalit, uh, what it means. Um, you can see here he lists 13 different... Um, Okay, so he, he mentions here, like, why is why is this book in the feminine gender? He poses that question. He gives 13 proposed meanings for the, the Hebrew title of this book, Koelet. And you can feel free to pause this and take your time on it if you want. It's a great example, once again, of, of um, his, his intelligence, um, just how incredibly thorough he was, and um, the, the breadth of his scholarship and research. All right, how did the title come to be feminine? He kind of talks about that. He gives seven reasons why the title is feminine. Beginning here, different opinions, ending here. Um, and it goes on from there. I already gave you a sampling of Ginsberg's style um, when we when we looked at his commentary on the Song of Songs. So I'm not going to do the same thing with this commentary. I'll let you kind of do that yourself if you're more interested in doing that. So basically, we'll wrap up our first conversation about the life and the work of Christian David Ginsburg there. That covers his, uh, his early years, uh, of which we have scant information, and it covers the romantic epoch of his life in his 20s, in which he, um, he got married. Um, had a good relationship with his in-laws, um, did extensive research into the five Megillot, um, three, three of which um, told the stories of, um, of the heroines, female heroes of scripture, and um, it's a great, great instances there of, um, of the heart of uh, Christian David Ginsburg. So we will um, pick up where we left off in our next conversation, looking at the um, the next epoch in the life of Ginsburg, uh, which I will be calling his epoch of power. I'm looking forward to having you join me for those conversations.